you out with a smile on your face and you feel good, but you know, to have a good Christian walk, you first have to become a Christian. And to become a Christian, you have to realize and understand what sin is in your life. It's not just about, well, okay, I'll just be good and I'll go to church and I can be a Christian. I need to know why I need Christ. And the only way we can know why we need Christ is to realize the sinful nature that we have. And so today we're going to look at the, the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. You can go ahead and be turning there. But you know, the story of Cain and Abel, it's a story that's literally as old as time, is it not? It's literally as old as recorded history. It's, there's a little bit of time before they were born, but it, it's been here forever. And so sin is nothing new in our life. But what we can see from this story of Cain and Abel is we can learn a whole lot about what sin is in our life. It's a story of anger. It's a story of envy, of pride, of jealousy. It's a story of murder. And uh, it's the same thing that we're still showing today in all of our TV shows, isn't it? Every good detective show, somebody's got jealous, somebody's got envious, somebody's, you know, some ulterior motive and, and uh, greed, whatever, and they committed a murder. And so here comes, here comes Frank Reagan coming in and he sends his son Danny out to investigate that dude, right? Okay. Let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his, his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Our most gracious Father in heaven, Lord God, open our eyes this morning to the sin in our life. Father, I pray today that you will show me the words that I need to say and to say them in a way that will be understood today plainly and clearly of our need to come to you, our need to repent unto you, Father, our need to turn away from our sinful ways. Father, I ask you today to forgive me of my sins and my sinfulness. And Father, help me to be contrite and repentant. And help me to be obedient to you and do the things that honor you and that uh, will guide me in your steps. Father, if there's anyone here today that has not turned from their sinfulness, may they come today accept you as Lord and Savior and give their heart and their life to you that they can be obedient to you and can live that Christian life that you've called them to live. Father, I thank you for each and every person that you have brought here today, that you have placed in your presence. Go with us now 
let your Holy Spirit work in our hearts and our minds. God, give me the words to say and uh, help me to deliver those words the way you would have me to deliver them. I ask all this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. You know, from the outside looking in, we just we, we see what should be the utopian family, right? I mean, you know, it's 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 everybody's dream. You got mom, you got dad, you got the kids, and everybody is living in this utopian rural agrarian society, and life is just really good, and I, you know. Everything just grows well, the, the fertile soil, and everybody's doing all the things that they want to do. And, and, you know, life should just really be grand and glorious, shouldn't it? You know, they just left the Garden of Eden, and here's they, they're having to do, a, do some things. But, you know, life should be good. It's that, you know, what we all dream about, right? That's what it looks like from the outside. It's like when you drive down the road and you see those big mansions and you see the boats in the yard and you see the travel trailers behind the house and the big pickups that's pulling the travel trailers and oh, they must just be so happy there. But see, when we dig deeper, when we look a little deeper, life is not what we what it appears to be. We look out on the uh, inside. We go to digging a little deeper and we see Cain and Abel. Two brothers, one's a farmer, one's a rancher. Well, you know, real ranchers don't really like farmers. Because we're just digging up all the grass that would feed the cows and their sheep. And real farmers don't like ranchers because they're not really using the land for what God had intended it to be. And we don't like each other. And we see all this anger and we see all this jealousy and we see all this uh, envy and, and spite in the, inside this family and the, and the brothers are, are at one another and, and both of them are probably a little bit mad because the reason they're having to work so hard is because of that little secret that mom and daddy done a few years back that we don't talk about anymore, right? <laughs> they're a little skeleton in the closet that they've got and, and that's why we're having to work so hard. So there's, it's not as rosy, peachy keen as you'd think it would be. And we've let those emotions build and we've let things burn and we see anger, jealousy, bitterness, envy, lying, and coveting. Sounds like a perfect script for a TV soap opera, doesn't it? <laughs> well, how you ladies watch some of them and maybe a few of you men. Well, what can we learn? What can we learn from the story of Cain and Abel? today. Well, the first thing that I see that's listed here is that improper attitude towards God. See, Cain and Abel were kind of at odds with one another maybe a little bit, but they both came and they brought an offering towards God. Now, this is early. You know, we this is like second generation of life. And there is no prescribed order to religion. Everybody just kind of brings and, and worships God the way, the way they see fit and the way the way that seems best to them. And, and these two young men bring their offering to God. <coughs> Abel brings his, from his flock, he brings the firstborn, he brings the best portions, he brings the best. He brings things to God, we kind of infer from what it says that he brings with a heart of gratitude and a heart of joy for what God has blessed him with. And he brings things to God with a good attitude. Cain, on the other hand, he just kind of grabs whatever's on the back of the wagon and you know brings him a few tomatoes and maybe some cucumbers and a little bit, and, but he saves the best for him. And see, Cain has a bad attitude towards God. Because he's saying that I deserve the best more than God does. I'm just as needy. I'm the one that's had to put all the work into all of this stuff. I'm the one that's done all of the sweating and the slaving and the hoeing and the picking and the planting and the watering and everything else. I'm the one that needs the best out of this. I'll just give God whatever I good and well please. An improper attitude. An improper attitude towards God 
is what leads us down a path of sin. We begin to see ourselves as just as important as God or maybe even put ourselves above God. And we begin to look at what we want and we look at things from the inside out of who we are and what we think we need. See, Abel brought his offerings willingly. He brought his offerings gratefully. Cain brought his begrudgingly. He brought his because he felt like he had to. You know, Abel done brought something. I guess I better bring something too. 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, Cain wasn't cheerful about his giving. Cain wasn't uh, uh, happy about having to give. He he felt like he had to keep God better. Better give some. Better keep God happy. My question for you this morning is: What's your attitude? What's your attitude towards your giving? towards your offering, towards your service to God? Do you tithe because you think you're better? Do you tithe because you know you better think you need to so God won't zap you? Do you, do you serve because, well, everybody will notice that I'm not there or I guess I better show up because somebody will be, be watching out for it. Do you do it because you have to or do you do it because you want to? Do you tithe because you want to? Do you tithe because you're grateful for what God has given to you? Do you serve because you just have so much joy in your heart that you want to share the word of God and share in the blessings that God has given to you and let other people know the joy that you have from there? What is your attitude? Or is it like, man, doggone it. I worked hard all week. I sweated and I slaved and I put this money together. I guess I'll put some in the offering plate, but I sure don't want to. I need that more than God needs that. What's your attitude today? Are you putting yourself in the place of God with your attitude towards your offerings and towards your service? You see, our, our, our tithing is not the only thing that we give to God. We give God all of ourselves. Amen. Not just part of ourselves. <clears throat> It's not just our money. It's not just our time. It's our talents, our gifts. Everything that we have belongs to God, and we need to willingly and gratefully give back to God because he has given so much to us. Amen. What is your attitude today? See, the second thing I see here is, you know, Cain's done kind of, messed up with God. He, he came begrudgingly. He's kind of placed himself in the in the place of God or equal with God. Oh, that sounds kind of like what Satan did, didn't he? He thought he was equal with God. Okay. But the thing we see here is that God gives him a second chance. See, God doesn't smite Cain for what he has done. God doesn't tell him how wrong he is. He just says, you know, if you get your attitude right, your whole life will be right. And God gives him a chance. God gives him an opportunity. He even gives him an option, gives him the choice to make his life right with God. He lets him think about what he has done and how he can live his life. And God does that with you and I, does he not? God is a God of second chances. If, if he struck each one of us down the first time we sinned, None of us would be here, would we? Amen. Because we all have sinned, have we not? So God gives Cain a second chance. And he gives him the opportunity to get his life right, to have that atti proper attitude towards God. 1 John 1 and 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But see, the thing we see about Cain is that he never confesses his sin. He never seeks God's righteousness. 
but he harbors that anger. He harbors all of those ill feelings and, and it just begins to stew. And we see God's given him the choice. Put that anger aside and honor God and worship God or continue in your life of anger and your life of bitterness. And so the third thing that we see here is Cain's decision. What does Cain decide to do? He realizes he can't do nothing about God because God's bigger than him, right? <laughs> so he gets angry with Abel. Then he goes and has a little talk with Abel. You're trying to show me up. You're trying to make me look bad, ain't you? And what happens? That anger boils over and he takes Abel's life. Well, once again, that's Cain putting himself in the place of God. Who is the giver and who is the taker of life? God is the one that gives us life. Amen. And it is God who is to take our life from us. Cain said, I'm just as worthy as God to decide whether you live or not. So he has gone and been disobedient to God again already. He's taken the most precious possession that Abel has. So he's coveted. He's been jealous. He's been angry. He's been bitter. He's been hateful. Look at all of those emotions that he will not let go and his life is bitter. His life is angry. See, he gets out in the field all by himself where nobody can see and he, he kills Abel. What more can you do to a man? Nothing. You have taken all that he has had. See, in, in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Let's turn there right quick. Verses 36 through 40 says, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. See, when you take a man's life, that's not demonstrating much love, is it? That's demonstrating your hatred. That's demonstrating that you're better than they are. That's totally opposed to what God stands for. That's totally against everything that he has taught us in our heart. That we're to treat one another the way we want to be treated. That golden rule, and also in Matthew chapter 6, I think. Do you want somebody to take your life? No. So we need to treat one another. We're not demonstrating God's love when we take someone else's life. Which leads us to the next point. Your sin is going to be brought to life. It will be visible. We may think we've got it hid. We may think we've got it covered up. We may think we've put this big fancy house around all of our troubles and all of our problems and that nobody in the world can see them, but God can see your sins. See, God tells Cain, the very ground that soaked up Abel's blood is shouting out to God and telling him, oh, we may, we may fool the FBI. We may fool NCIS and Jethro Gibbs. We may even fool Frank and Danny Reagan a little bit. But we don't fool God. God knows. Amen. God sees your heart. God sees your attitude and why you have done everything that you have done. Luke chapter 12, verses 2 and 3 says, But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the rooftops. Y'all ever hear of anything called uh, Twitter and YouTube and Facebook? <laughs> Man, you just make one offhand statement and it gets broadcast everywhere, don't it? But what's even worse than that? God already knows it before it hits the airwaves. God knows your heart. God knows your actions. God knows your motivations for everything. We do not cover them up. We may think we're fooling people. We may put on the suit and the tie and the fancy jewelry. We may, we may try to look like. We're living the good life and that everything is wonderful to beat your king, but we've got 
seeing it in their heart no more. And you know, the scripture tells us, for all have sinned. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, when we do not live the life that God's called us to live, when we do not demonstrate that love to other people that God has called us to love, when we are disobedient to God, and disrespectful to God. We have sinned. And each and every one of us are guilty of that because we all think we are somebody important until we begin to realize that we're not important. God is who is important. And it doesn't matter if you're, what, Levi, are you 10? Nine? You're nine. So it don't matter if you're nine or 90. We've sinned. All of us have sinned. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher or if you're a Justin. You know? You're a sinner. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if we confess our sins, as I said in 1 John 9, 1 and 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. Amen. Don't fool yourself. God sees what you're doing. God knows what you're doing. He knows why you're doing what you're doing. He, under, he sees those emotions that are running through you. He knows whether you're submitting to the sinfulness of your life or not. So what? Well, the last thing that I see here is sin has consequences, does it? There are consequences to our sin. See, Cain has never confessed his sin. Cain has never been repentant of any of his sin. He's never tried to change his attitude towards God. He's never done it. And it has consequences. The very ground that was producing the food that he farmed, you know, he just farmer Justin. He just went out and he planted his lettuce and his onions and his <clears throat> broccoli, Billy. <laughs> <clears throat> the ground that was producing what sustained him is going to turn its back on him. And it's going to become unproductive for him because of what he has done. He's going to become a vagrant and a wanderer and, and have no home to speak of. He's, people are going to despise him and look down on him and he's going to be ostracized so he has lost his fellowship. He's lost that relationship with mankind. But worst of all, what does it tell us there? I think it was in verse 12. And your face will be hidden from me. He will lose his relationship with God. He will lose that fellowship with God. He will not be able to see God because sin builds a barrier between us and God until we come with repentance, until we come with remorse and ask God to forgive us. There's a barrier built between us and God and we cannot fellowship and have a relationship with God because in our sinful nature, we are opposed to God. You know, in, in Romans, it tells us while we were yet enemies, when we're sinful, we are enemies with God. We're opposed to all that he stands for. You know, God should have, God could have taken Cain's life right then, couldn't he? Well deserved. You know, we, we think that we, we deserve so much, but we really don't deserve anything. It says, you know, Romans 6 and 23 tells us for the wages of sin, what we have earned from our sinfulness, and we're all sinners, right? What we have earned from our sinfulness, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God, free gift, totally undeserved, unexpected, just a total blessing. The free gift of God is life everlasting through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
See, sin has its consequences. God should have, God could have smoked Cain and wiped him off the face of the earth and maybe solved a lot of problems in our world, but God is not only a God of second chances, God is a God of third chances and fourth chances, and he continues to give Cain an opportunity to change. God continues to put his protection around him and prevents others from trying to kill him. God continues to watch over him in hopes that at some point in time, Cain's attitude towards him will change. Amen. Because God wishes that none of us should perish. He wishes to draw us in. He wishes us to be his loving child. But Cain never demonstrates that he does. In fact, if we continue to read, it's kind of like Cain thumbs his nose at God continually. So what are you doing today? What's your attitude towards your giving? Are you still harboring all of those anger and that bitterness that's in your heart? That jealousy between one another, are you allowing your anger towards God to be demonstrated in your attitude and actions towards one another? You know, we get mad at God, we can't do anything about it, so we take our anger out on our brothers and our sisters, our fellow human beings. Have you been repentant? Have you examined your heart and changed your attitude towards God? Have you confessed your sins? Have you sought his forgiveness? The choice is yours. God gives us choices and God gives us chances. Amen. But you know, we sang that song, I'll fly away. There comes a point in time when you don't have another chance. It's only while you're here, while you're breathing, that you have the opportunity to honor God, to love God, and to serve God, and to recognize that he is the creator of your life. Amen. And to give your life back to him because he gave it to you and to let him use your life. Where are you today in your life? Have you ever given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ? Because he is the only way that we can come to God. Amen. He is that bridge that crosses that great chasm of sin that's been built between us. <clears throat> that we built ourselves. We dug that hole. Have you turned aside from your anger, from your jealousy, from your bitterness, from your covetousness? See, any of those sins is saying that you are equal to God. Your sin is not really against mankind. You may, you may wrong your brother, but you're sinning against God. You need to examine your life today. I mean seriously examine your life. Are you being like Cain or are you being like Abel? Do you come gratefully, willingly, joyfully and bring God the best of what you've got? Or do you begrudgingly and under compulsion just bring the leftovers because you deserve more. You deserve more. Is God speaking to your heart today? What's in your life today? Would you stand with me, please? <coughs> Lord God in heaven, you are patiently waiting for each and every one of us, giving us second chance and third chance and 453rd chance to come to you humbly, and repentantly offering our life to you, Father God. Father, but you're not going to wait forever. There comes a point in time when we no longer have the choice. We no longer have the opportunity. Father, if there is anyone today that has not given their heart and soul to you, whether they be five years old or 95 years old, Father, you're giving them that chance, that opportunity. Father, their life will be so much better, so much more joyful, so much more enjoyable if they will just give their life to you. Amen. 
Father, if there's anyone today that needs to know you as Lord and Savior, may they come now. Father, if there's anyone today that has just kind of become lackadaisical and is not really serving you with a true heart of gratitude, they're not giving to you with a heart of gratitude. Father, change their heart today. Help them to come to you on good and evil. Father, we lift this time of invitation to you today. Any decisions that need to be made, we lift to you, Father, and we pray that you will work in people's heart today. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. As we sing, if God speaks.